Well, welcome everyone. Welcome this morning to Trinity Church and our adult forum here on January, uh, January the 10th. It's my great privilege this morning uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Joseph Fox, who is a longtime um, uh, resident and uh, involved deeply in the life of our city. And um, actually, I'm going to let Dr. Fox just tell us a little bit about him. And he's here to talk with us today about an exciting and amazing project going on in our city and county called the Remembrance Project. And so, um, Dr. Fox, tell us a little bit about you and your your um, work here. I'm, I'm happy to be joining you today. Uh, I'm retired from the North Carolina Community College System where I was the department chair of business at AB Tech uh, for the last seven years. And I'm the vice president of the board for the MLK Association of Asheville and Buncombe County, as well as the chair of the Buncombe County Remembrance Project and the chair of the Peace March and Rally. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, well, what we're going to do today is um, you're going to, uh, we've asked you to help us understand the Remembrance Project, and uh, that will take most of our time today, but then we'll come back next week and have some questions and um, a little bit more exploration about it and our, the ways in which people are, are involved. So thank you. And um, so let me just go ahead and invite you to tell us more about the Remembrance Project. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen with you all this morning. And so we will be uh, confronting current racial issues through the, the Remembrance Project. And so just to give you a little background, around how the project got started. There were several groups in Asheville, including the board of the MLK Association that was working, we were working separately around the Equal Justice uh, Initiative. We were asked um, as the MLK Association to become the lead association to make sure that we were able to bring the historical marker to Asheville and Buncombe County that recognizes three individuals of record that were lynched um, as part of uh, understanding the, the history of our county. And so the Remembrance Project is part of the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, their National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which is a, na a nationwide initiative with the goal to remember folks uh, that have been lynched in individual counties throughout the United States. And of course, we're looking specifically here at those um, in Buncombe County. So the project goals were to more accurately reflect the history of racial and economic injustice and inequalities, uh, particularly here in Buncombe County, to foster healing from the silent trauma uh, that has occurred because of, of Jim Crow uh, uh, procedures, lynchings, mass incarceration, violence in communities, and, and uh, state-sanctioned violence such as police brutality. We also created a goal of, to foster local conversations and reflections concerning community healings. So we didn't want to just uh, recognize these individuals that were uh, lynched in Buncan County, but we also wanted to move the communities towards healings. Uh, and we're doing that through our uh, community programmings, programming such as uh, this today, uh, and transforming narratives around the true history of what has occurred, particularly in the South. According to the Equal Justice Initiative, more than 4,400 African-American men, women, and children were hanged, burnt, alive, shot, drowned, or beaten um, during the period of 1877 to 1950. Now, we know that uh, these uh, lynchings occurred more than just that time period. But when the Equal Justice Initiative set up their initial programming, uh, they wanted to have a period of time in our history that they could realistically research. And so what they found was there was a big uptick in uh, lynchings. And when we say lynchings, uh, they, those go beyond just hangings. Lynchings are defined as any mob uh, uh, 
actions towards individuals or a community and particularly uh, tied to racial violence. And so um, after the Civil War, there was a, a huge uptick in violence towards uh, African Americans. And again, that included men, women, and children. So the, the three individuals of record that were lynched um, in Buncombe County was John uh, Humphreys, uh, which occurred July the 15th, 1880, Hezekiah Rankin, which occurred uh, 9-24, 1891, and Bob Brackett, which occurred 8-11, uh, 1897. And so we, one of our research groups is actually researching the case uh, around these three individuals. We created a file around uh, old articles, uh, clippings uh, around these three incidents and where they occurred uh, throughout Buncombe County. And so we uh, will be then uh, petitioning the, the city of Asheville to place a historical marker uh, in honor of these three individuals. So as we were looking at how we would set up our operating structure uh, to move this forward, this, this project forward, we started holding pre-COVID, of course, uh, community stakeholders <laughs> group meetings. And um, we had over 18 organizations and groups and individuals uh, that started coming to our kind of our town hall approach forums where we were discussing uh, the project, our goals, the history of racial violence. Um, and from that initial group, we then formed a steering committee, which is made up of about 17 organizations throughout um, Asheville and Buncombe County. The steering committee then formed individual work groups based on the requirements from the Equal Justice Initiatives uh, checklist of things that must, must occur for Buncombe County to be recognized mm -hmm. as a partner uh, with them around peace and, and uh, racial healing. So our, our work groups initially were our communication PR work group, which um, were tasked with uh, disseminating information around the project, uh, getting information out to various groups, asking folks to join us. Uh, that communication PR work group has created uh, uh, two short videos around the project that we will be um, unveiling during the MLK uh, Dr. King holiday uh, week of activities. We have a, a community engagement work group and that work group is to just to engage the community to find out what their history, their shared stories and knowledge has been, uh, as well as to inform them again around uh, what we're doing with this project, but also to get input around um, the project, the need for the project, and how we heal as a community. We have the museum tour work group. Uh, at this point, we had taken uh, two groups to um, the museum in Alabama um, to see the actual um, monuments. Uh, we had a, another group that was supposed to go last March. Uh, and of course we had to cancel because of COVID-19. So that group is looking at uh, future tours where we can take folks. We've had uh, the Lynch and Research Group that I have mentioned that's doing the research uh, around these three uh, lynchings. We have the Logistical Historical Marker Site Location Work Group that is working to look at um, what would be an appropriate location for this historical marker. And when, and when I mention historical marker, it's um, pretty much, it looks like the historical uh, landmark markers that folks are, are familiar with. So generally they're at the corner of two, uh, the intersection of a street that marks a historical site. So the Equal Justice Initiative has encouraged um, their partners in this project to place those historical markers in a location of significance. So either where the lynching took place, if possible, or if there was a court case um, somewhere in that area. And so we're, that, that group is currently 
reaching out to the city uh, around uh, site locations, uh, currently looking somewhere around uh, either where the old courthouse used to be uh, in Asheville or uh, around the area where the courthouse currently uh, resides. We have the essay contest, uh, which is uh, reaching out to high schools uh, to get uh, high school students involved with racial healing and research. Uh, and so that work group has started their work. Um, they will be kicking off their main work within a net, another week. Uh, and then we have the educational outreach work group uh, that does workshops uh, and, and seminars around uh, this project. And the compliance work group is just checking all the boxes to make sure that we are in compliance with all the requirements out of the Equal Justice uh, Initiative. So part of trying to understand where we have come from to now to get to this place um, and, and I think this is probably really relevant as we um, think about what's going on in, in our nations uh, today. Uh, some of the historical information that we share is that in 1969, we had the Dutch ship that dropped anchor in Jamestown, Virginia with a, a cargo of 20 Africans. And so that's kind of known as the, the first um, shipment of enslaved people into uh, the new world. And then we see that uh, the first constitutional convention met in Philadelphia in 1787. Um, and they, they really looked at uh, representation and uh, slavery and define slaves as property. And, and what that did is it set our nation on a pathway of what we refer to as system biases. Because at that time, if you were property, you were not able to own property. And so when we talk about uh, the haves and the have nots and wealth uh, gaps and educational gaps, achievement gaps, opportunity gaps. It was created in our history from the beginning where enslaved folks were uh, labeled property. Therefore, they could not own property. They could not accumulate wealth. And we know from our history um, that in, at one point they weren't even uh, afforded an education. In 1803, and we're, we're skipping a lot of history, but we wanted to just kind of give us a framework of, of how relevant this project has become. So in 1803, uh, less than 10 years after the invention of the cotton gin, we had more than 20,000 Negroes um, that made up the New England slave trade and were brought to Georgia and South Carolina. And so our project really tried to focus more on our regional area uh, versus the, the entire South so that we could understand just kind of the mentality that was being created uh, in the South in terms of how we treated uh, folks of a darker hue. Uh, the, and then we see in um, Mississippi Supreme Court says in the eyes of the law, a Negro is primary facious, a slave, therefore a slave. And so what that did is we started seeing slavery and enslavement actually be uh, part of state constitution, state laws. And so when we talk about the strides that folks have made, um, some of it has been a challenge because it was part of some state constitutions. We know that we had the Civil War, um, began in 1861, lasted to 1865. And that's where this project research begins because at that point we started having Jim Crow laws um, where uh, folks, particularly in the South said, we may have lost a war, but we have not lost a battle. And so to maintain power and control we will enact a, a number of Jim Crow laws, uh, and particularly for the uh, around uh, individuals that have been enslaved, and now they're free, and we're having constitutional amendments to give those folks the, the, the right to vote. And so this is where we started having this national conversation around voter suppression, where you have this huge population of now free folks that are fighting for the right to vote, 
uh, those in power, the gatekeepers, are afraid if we give folks the right to vote, then they're going to vote those folks out a party, and they're going to have a uh, a huge political uh, voice in, in terms of a block of voting. We also see a, a, a rise of police brutality at this point. And this is a point of our history that we won't go into today, but where we start seeing Klansmen uh, infiltrate, in, infiltrate the police departments and grass, grassroots efforts. Um, so that again, to maintain that power and control. And we see massacres against folks that are now free and now are protesting for the right to vote, for better jobs, et cetera. So in terms of taking the temperature of America, we see at the end of and during the Civil War, some really ugly facts uh, pop up. Uh, under the Black Flag um, Law, which was one of the, the first massacres, it's a massacre at Fort uh, Pillars. And it's an ugly fact of the Civil War that the Confederate Army on several occasions refused to accept the surrender of uniform colored troops. Um, so in at Fort uh, Pillar in mm -hmm. April, um, we see uh, uh, uprising, and uh, we have in the spring of 80, 1864, we have Nation Bedford Forest uh, and 6,000 troops mount up uh, to drive the Yankees from Western Tennessee and Kentucky. The fort appears, uh, forest appears before Fort Pillar on April the 12th, and inside uh, the fort is, are 557 men. Uh, two units of colored um, gr uh, gunsmen uh, and a detachment of turncoats uh, in Tennessee cavalry. When the Yankee com commander refuses to surrender, um, uh, initially, they, they, um, there's a scream of no quarters and black flags, meaning that they're going to kill everyone that's in the, the fort. So the reports concluded that 300 to 400 of these garrison were killed at Fort Pillar, uh, not allowed to uh, surrender, and that uh, of the 300, uh, they were mur murdered in cold blood uh, after they had tried to surrender. Forrest is never uh, really tried for war crimes. And, and in fact, after the Civil War ends, um, he fights on as the first grand wizards of the, the KKK. And so this is beginning to set the tone of um, lynchings and violence uh, to continue uh, in the South after the Civil War. We have uh, in Louisiana, uh, 60 to 150 African-Americans uh, killed uh, in the Colfax massacre of 1873. Historians are not sure how many people really died at the, in, in the end, but it was recorded that um, there had been a death of three white men. And as that occurred, then uh, the uh, mob attacked up to 150 Black residents in retaliation. While the massacre uh, made headlines across the country, 97 members of the white mob were indicted but in the end, only nine men were charged with violating the Enforcement Act of 1870 and 1871, which is commonly known as the uh, Ku Klux Klan Act that was really intended to guarantee the right of freemen under the 14th uh, Amendment. Uh, and so when we started this project, we really started trying to research some of the violence in uh, this area. We see uh, the Ty Baldus massacre of 1887, where uh, African-American cane workers in Louisiana attempted to organize for better pay. On November the 23rd, 1887, a mass shooting of African-American farm workers uh, in Louisiana left some, some 60 dead uh, in unmarked graves. And so uh, part of our research here is to give folks Citation. So, you know, I'll be sharing this PowerPoint uh, with you all so that you can get more details ar around these incidents. Wonderful. Uh, that occurred um, 
with the East St. Luke's uh, Lewis uh, massacre of, of 1917. So we're moving into the 1900s and we see still uh, a history of violence as we come into the, the 1900s. Uh, this was a labor dispute, again, African-Americans trying to get better pay, better jobs. By the end of the three-day crisis, the official death toll were 39 Black individuals and nine whites, uh, but they're believed that more than 100 African-Americans were killed. Uh, additional that we'll just kind of go through fairly quickly here. Uh, in Arkansas, 1919, we have sharecroppers who gathered in a small church um, to discuss unfair labor laws. Around 11 p.m. that night, a group of local white men, uh, some of whom had uh, may have been affiliated with local law enforcement, fired shots in the church. Uh, shots were returned from the church and uh, one white man was killed. And so that spread quickly. And so the mob gathered and Governor Charles uh, Brock called for 500 soldiers uh, to come in uh, to round up the heavily armed Negroes. The troops were under order to shoot to kill any Negro who refused to surrender immediately. They went uh, well beyond that, banding together with local uh, vigilantes and killing at least 200 uh, African Americans. And it's estimated that that was really a higher number. The one that most folks are more familiar uh, out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, that's been in the news more recently is the uh, Black Wall Street massacre, um, where you had uh, a, a self-sufficient uh, area of Tulsa where um, Black residents had gathered they had created their own businesses, they had created their own banks, um, and they were being successful. And because of their success, uh, we see a mob of white folks uh, come in and they destroyed more than 35 blocks of this area, uh, along with 1,200 homes and some 300 people uh, died. Now, uh, most more recently, research is going on around this, this particular massacre uh, where they're actually uncovering additional uh, unmarked graves, mass graves. And so uh, once all this research is done around this particular massacre, it's predicted that those numbers are gonna go up much higher. To kind of end, uh, get, getting close to our end here, we wanted to pull some things more relevant to our area. So uh, in South Carolina, we've had a number of bloody riots uh, in Ellington, South Carolina, and a couple of other areas. Uh, and if anyone that's been to Greenville, South Carolina, have probably been down Wade Hampton Boulevard. Wade Hampton uh, was an individual um, that uh, really during this time period of 18, the late 1870s, um, had said after the uh, the war to President Hayes that uh, you know if if you don't remove federal troops that were brought into the South and particularly in South Carolina to protect uh, the newly freed uh, individuals, you'll have a second civil war on your hand. Is basically what he says in the text. It calls it a, he waved the bloody shirt, um, and this is where we see President Hayes start bringing out the pulling the federal troops out. And again, a rise of, of terrorism uh, in Black communities. Tillman, uh, if you are familiar with Furman University and Tillman Hall, and the more recently uh, renaming of Tillman Hall, uh, actually won a victory as its governor over at Wade Hampton uh, because Wade Hampton followers felt like he had not totally eliminated the Negro as completely out of South Carolina as he had promised his followers. And so uh, again, we have Wilmington had a big uh, uh, race riot around white supremacy. We have Tillman becomes uh, a Senator uh, in South Carolina. 
his big thing was to disenfranchise um, uh, colored people is how he stated. And, and in the archives, his actual um, narrative says, uh, we have done our level best. We have scratched our heads to find out how we could eliminate the last one of them. We have stuffed ballot boxes, we have shot them, and we are not afraid of it. So as you look at this narrative, you see what's going on in this, this area, in, this, in our south, uh, southern states. And so we see a, a huge amount of, of violence uh, towards people of a darker hue. And so we, we also start looking at the lasting impact around this violent history in, in the US. So when we look at the culture that was created, we have institutions such as Win Dixie. Uh, I have friends from other countries that uh, in visiting a few years ago, and that we were um, we went to a Win Dixie, and um, we were in the, the Charlotte Statesville area at the time. And uh, one of the guys said, you, "You do understand what that term means, don't you?" And I said, "Oh yeah, I, I'm very uh, much aware of it because of the type of work that I do. I said, but a lot of times we take names for granted and don't look at the historical significance of it. So when Dixie, Dixie tires, Dixie cleaners, a whole slew of organizations tied to our history. Um, the, the battle flag that most folks refer to as the Confederate flag, technically we don't have a Confederate flag. We have an uh, uh, a earlier flag that during the Civil War, the bars, uh, the X was put on that flag uh, in protest to the Civil War. Uh, and that has commonly been called the Confederate flag. We have the Dixie song uh, growing up in this area. Uh, I remember at, at almost every football game, the start of the game, the band would play uh, the Dixie song. And if you ever look, really look at the lyrics of that song, it has historical significance of a, a cultural narrative. Uh, it created implicit bias where we talk about implicit bias being unconscious. Uh, that a lot of folks, uh, particularly uh, folks of, of uh, a wider hue, um, have privilege that they're not even aware of. It's so unconscious. It's so implicitly built into the system. This is how it's always done. Uh, the devaluing of Black lives. And so when we you hear in the news, the movement of Black Lives Matter, and, and recently with uh, everything that was going on, going on in the Capitol building, and the contrast between how those folks were treated uh, versus the protesters for the Black Life Movement. Uh, you know, often when I'm doing diversity, equity, and inclusion training, uh, I get asked, well, doesn't blue life matter? Don't all life matters? And I'm like, well, the, it's, the Black Life Movement is not saying that these other lives don't matter. They all always right. have mattered. So when you look at our history and the massacres and the enslavement, um, what we're what that movement is saying is that Black lives have never mattered. They have always been devalued in uh, the United States. The other piece of that is it created fear and distrust of the criminal justice systems. Uh, and so when you look at uh, things like Bull Connors out of um, Birmingham, you look at the how the Freedom Riders were treated. You look at Sheriff uh, Jim Clark in, in Selma, Alabama and Bloody Sunday. There has always been a distrust in black, uh, black and brown communities of police officers because they have not been treated the same uh, as folks with a different hue of, of, of skin tone. And then we saw uh, mass incarceration. So to end, what we hope this project will do is move folks from being defensive when we have these conversations and minimizing folks' experiences and particularly minimizing uh, folks of a darker hues uh, experience here in the United States to move to recognizing acknowledgement acceptance and adaptation on how we view our cultural narratives. 
We also hope to enhance multicultural cultural consciousness around Black Lives Matter, what that movement really is about, uh, and, and embrace some of those, uh, those tenets of that movement to increase to cultural competency, to address cultural biases, uh, to create a non-racist environment, and to eliminate perception concerning non-majority people. So you've been start using the right terminology. So the, today you've heard me say non-majority um, versus majority. You, you've heard me say uh, individuals of a darker hue. Um, you know, if you're technically, if you're not of an African descent, you're technically not African-American. When we did mm -hmm. my DNA historical genealogy, my family roots are traced back to Spain. So technically, I, my family roots are not African-American, it's European-American. So I do a whole series around uh, what, what words mean. Demonstrating respect for others, uh, rights and dignity, and decoding cultural biases, uh, and also moving people uh, to be more inclusive and not diverse. So we're um, you know, right there at the end of our 30 minutes um, presentation, but I wanted to share some of those uh, that information. I know it's a lot of information. Usually I take about a two hour period uh, with most of those presentations. Oh, well, it, it is two hours worth of the presentation, isn't it? And I'm so deeply appreciative uh, for your time this morning. And I've got so many questions in my brain, and we're going to get to these questions next week. So um, write down your questions um, and uh, have them ready. Um, let me know them. Send them to me by email. Um, uh, or call me, uh, let me know your questions and we will um, work on uh, approaching them each uh, next week. Uh, Dr. Fox, I can't, I can't thank you enough for being with us today and I look forward to next week. I, I look forward to it also. Thank you.